day. So welcome to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Again, really glad that you're joining us either live or in the recording. And we, of course, want to thank our presenting sponsors. You can see their logos on the screen in front of you. Thank you so much to these sponsors and for being a partner, because this conversation, you know, we started the show in the middle of March and we have continued the show as a live daily webcast. Over 200 episodes have been recorded and shared with you. Um, thanks to our amazing sponsors. So please do go find them in the internet, give them some love, some likes, and just, you know, say, Hey, thanks. Thanks for elevating this conversation. Um, Julia, you have definitely been wonderful to work with. So Julia Patrick is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy without your brainchild behind this, Julia, we would not be here doing this. Like this is, this is really fun. I've had a lot of fun serving as your co-host. I'm Jarrett Ransom, also known as the nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. And I am again, just beside myself, Rich Frazier is one of my favorite people in the sector. I'm really blessed that I get to call you a friend, Rich, a colleague, a peer, a senior consultant with IPM Advancement. So welcome to you, Rich, and thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you, Jarrett. Thank you, Julia. It's great to be here. And thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, we're really excited about this. You know, um, the capital campaign strikes fear, excitement, terror, gratitude, all these emotions that go on. And so for me, it's kind of a mystery, like how it all works and what's behind it. And so we really wanted to get you on to talk about this because we feel like um, there's just so many opportunities and yet, and I have to say fear, um, where do we go with this concept? So we really mm -hmm. wanted to kind of get your wisdom on that. And for those of, of us and the uninitiated, what is a capital campaign? Sure. And, and I totally get where, where you're coming from when, it, when, when, when we talk about sort of the, the, the enigma behind capital campaigns, right? Because unless you've been through one, it, it, there's, you really don't know what it's like. It, 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 I feel like I've spent most of my 31 years in, in the nonprofit sector doing, being a part of capital campaigns. I literally started my career in a $12 million, $11 million capital campaign. So, I mean, it, 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 it has been part of my professional life for a really long time. Um, but just so let me get back to your question. So what is a capital campaign? So by definition, it is a specific fundraising effort for a specific cause, right? And it usually has a defined time frame, which means we have a beginning of the campaign and we have an end of the campaign. So it doesn't go on forever. Um, and and it, it gives the organization, the nonprofit organization, an opportunity to do something bigger and, and go beyond the bounds of its annual fundraising and to, to meet very uh, special needs or specific needs within the community. So I'll just stop at that definition there. And yeah. we can expand on it as we need to. So is it in addition to an annual campaign? Oh yeah, yes. So, so typically when we talk about capital campaigns, we're talking about stretch gifts. So annual, yes. annual giving is going to be sort of checkbook giving, right? It's, it's what I've got in my bank account and it's something that I can easily make on an, on an annual gift. I may or may not let my significant other know, you know if, we're, if we give to different organizations. Um, a capital campaign is usually going to be looking at the larger giving, larger type of giving. And um, many times it's, it's pledge based. So Thanks. it might be a stretch gift of such a nature that it's, it's based upon asset giving and it's going to be pledged over a period of years. And so that is something that's going to take, um, first of all, from a donor perspective, it's going to take a, uh, more planning to make that kind of gift and more conversations with family, more conversations with the development office. And from a, a, a solicitor or, or nonprofit organization standpoint, it takes a lot more cultivation right. and it takes a lot more of, of, of making that case for support about why this gift is, is important and the impact that it'll make. Yeah, so, I have a question to bump onto that, Rich. Would a, an, a state bequest plan giving environment flow into this or would that be something separate? 
You know, it's, uh, I think that estate plans are a big part of capital campaigns. Okay. Um, and and, and I, it's certainly on the university level, on uh, like a large healthcare organization, they, they are, are, are always going to be looking at estate plans because they are the biggest players in the plan giving game, right? Um, and that's not to say that they're the only players, but they certainly have, have um, a lock on the game. They know how to do that. And I, and I characterize it as a game, but I, I think we all know what, I'm, what, what I mean there. Um, but yes, they, it, it is going to be a part of the capital campaign, understanding that those gifts, they aren't realized until the donor passes away. And then sometimes it might be multiple generations that, that have to, um, gosh, this is such, uh, that, you know, it, it, the on. gift might, yes, the gift yeah. might, might survive yeah. multiple generations, right? So um, typically in, in my experience where I've seen those estate gifts come into play is really kind of helping to fund endowments and, you know, estate gifts kind of are found money, even if, though it's planned, even though it's solicited and asked for, it's when it comes in, it's always unexpected. Yes. Um, and it, it is money that um, you don't plan on, you don't budget for it on a, for most cases. And it's a great place to, a great kind of gift to plug into an endowment. Yeah, and, I'm, and I'm speaking of big, broad characteristics, right? And this is of not- course. Yeah. Of course. You know, it makes me think, Julia, of our guest, Kyle Daniels, with uh, the Chicago Field Museum. And he focused, like, he is a plan giving officer, Rich. So, you know, when, when we struggle on having the conversations because it's not our main, you know, focus when it comes to fundraising, like, there are plan giving officers and they absolutely should plug into the conversations of capital campaigns. But what I want to add um, and really just emphasize of what you said, Rich, is that these are stretch gifts. You know, we're seeking like really stretch gifts in our capital. And I know we're going to talk about management, like how do we manage capital campaigns and just overall, like how does this work? What does this look like? You know, so when it comes to capital campaign management and you have these pledges that do, you know, carry on two, three, five years, you know, there, it really is a strategy and a process and a system that needs to be considered. So talk to us about how you work with your clients across the nation, truly with capital campaigns and the management piece. Right. You know, all of what you say is true and, and, and capital campaign management is very important and it all starts even before the campaign. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the work that I do as a campaign consultant is helping organizations get ready for all of that. And the, you know, we're all familiar with sort of the 80-20 rule, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and, and capital campaigns are, are, are a prime example of the 80-20 rule. In a capital campaign, 80 to 90% of your goal is going to come from 10 to 20% of your donors. Right. Well, I would say that most of the work of a capital campaign is going to come on the front end of the capital campaign. So it's preparing for a capital campaign. It's making sure that, you know, we're, we're very clear on mission and vision and we understand what our organization is about. We're very clear on the goal. What is it that we're trying to raise? What, what, how much are we trying to raise? What, what is it that money going to do? And it's never about our needs as an organization. It's about those needs out there in the community about why we exist as a nonprofit in the first place and, and how this campaign is going to help us propel our mission even further down the road and help whatever that cause is in the community that we want to help. Um, preparing for a campaign, you know, making sure that we've got the donor base to support a campaign, right? Um, making sure that, you know, that, that um, you know, we, we understand what that chart of gifts looks like, that how many gifts do we need at each level to be successful in this campaign, and that we've got at least a, a handful of, of donors in our donor base who can fall into those different categories. 
And it's understanding um, what the community feedback is going to be on this campaign and really has to do a, a feasibility study. And I, and, I, and I just sort of preempted your question on that one, Jared. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know, um, I was chomping at the bits, like, do we need a feasibility study? Yeah. Um, what does that mean? I, I would I would absolutely advise a feasibility study, and I know that there are some organizations that 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 uh, don't do a feasibility study. Yes. Um, but for I think for most organizations who are contemplating a capital campaign, especially if you haven't done a capital campaign before, or if a capital campaign is not part of your norm, and I'm saying you know you're not a university, you're not a major healthcare system, if you're just that. It, it, and I don't want to say just a 501c3, right? Because yeah. we're, there are so many important missions out there. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's but if a capital campaign is not part of your norm, if it doesn't happen on a regular cycle, that, that maybe you've had one or two campaigns in the past, you absolutely should do a feasibility study because here's where you really got to get to test your case for support. Are we telling the right story? Are we going after the right cause? You, you get to test your constituency. So, you know, let's go out and talk to the people who are closest to our organization and the people that we feel who can give us the best feedback and see if we have the constituency to support this goal, to, to see if we have the right goal, to see if um, we have confidence in this organization, right? So do we have the right leadership in place on the board of directors? Um, are there volunteers out there who are willing to step up and help lead this campaign? So we're not only looking for validation of our case for support, but we're also looking for people to step up and self-identify to be a lead gift donor or other size donor and to step up and say, you know what? I think this is important and I've got this, the, this sway in the community that I would like to be part of your campaign cabinet. I want, when I do a feasibility study, I want to find a way to say yes, but in a, in a legitimate way, right? I want, to, I want to come back to an organization and say, okay, well, we tested your case for support. There's a few holes. Maybe we need to refine the case for support. We need to go back and, and adjust it a little bit. But you know, we also found the, the support out there for this campaign, the financial support. We've got somebody who's self-identified who can give 15 to 20% of the goal. Um, we've got others who can step up and give other types of lead or major gifts. And we've got, we've got people who have identified themselves as potential leaders for your campaign. So those are the types of things that we're looking for in a feasibility study. If you don't do a feasibility study, you miss out on all of that. And you miss out on that opportunity for the community to say, to give you their thoughts and their opinions on this campaign and, and its effectiveness or its potential effectiveness. Rich, and I've ask, been, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Let me ask you this. How long is that process? Because I've heard it called, you know, the quiet phase, or I mean, there's, you know, a whole bunch of different things, but when we are looking at this, I, I guess this is a two-part question. How mm -hmm. long would that feasibility study really take? And should you have an external person doing it or should this be internal? Because are you going to get different answers depending on who's asking those questions? Right. Um, what does that look like? So the feasibility study, it, it, there's a lot of factors that determine the, the length of the feasibility study. And, um, and so, it, it, I typically like to budget three to six months to do a feasibility study. And the reason for that is that it takes us a little bit of time to come in and assimilate to your organization. Um, and what I mean by that is anytime we start working with a new client, we have to learn a new language because every nonprofit has their own vernacular. And we want to make sure that we are sitting at the table with you, that we are part of your team, and that we understand how to speak your language and how to talk about your organization, because we're then going to use that information to write a preliminary case for support. And that's what we're going to take out and test in the feasibility study. The next part of that is finding the right people to talk to. And we would depend on that nonprofit organization to help us find the right people to talk to. You know better than us who to talk to, right? And so we're gonna depend on you to identify those people and to help get those people to, to meet with 
the the feasibility study facilitator or the that 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 lead person on the on the feasibility team. Um, and so that what in our history uh, or in our, our experience, that really is what takes the most time is identifying the right people and getting them scheduled to talk. And there's a lot of online tools that make that job a lot easier than it used to be. Uh, so, you know, that we can streamline that. Um, the other question was, should we hire somebody from outside to do that? And at, at the risk of sounding self-serving, I'm going to say, yes, it's better to have somebody outside do your feasibility study. Here's why. It's a very simple reason. People will tell me things that they won't tell you to your face. And we want honest and candid feedback. And I can honestly go to them and, and say, listen, I, Julia, w thank you for meeting with me on this feasibility study. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. We may go down some rabbit holes depending on your answers, but anything that you tell me is going to be strictly confidential. It won't go past the IPM team. We'll use your information to inform our recommendations to the organization. But I don't share that information with the organization. I will share um, themes. I will share uh, big thoughts and ideas. Um, and if it comes down to a solicitation to Julia, and I know that Julia is interested in bunny rabbits and kitty cats, I'm going to let them know that you're interested in bunny rabbits and kitty cats, right? But I'm not going to give away the, 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 or the, the information that you specifically told me in that interview. Yeah. So that's well, why you should hire somebody outside because you get a lot better information. Right. So when we talk about outside, when I have two questions, but you know, do we really need to bring someone from outside our community, Rich, or do we really need to find someone who knows those leaders, as you say, that sway in the community? Like, do we need our own community champions to lead the charge of the campaign and the feasibility? Or, you know, are there benefits to bringing in someone outside the community? So, uh, I, I, I feel like there's a couple of different questions there. Um, I would say when you're thinking about hiring a consultant, whether it's somebody that is from your community or somebody that, that, that's from outside your community, mm -hmm. there's a ton of people, there's a ton of consultants who know how to do feasibility studies and know how to help manage a capital campaign. And I would say when you're, when you are, interviewing consultants or talking to consultants, um, look for a good personality fit because you're gonna be working with this person very closely and they're gonna be part of your team. So would you hire this person? Would you want to this person on your staff? Right. I think that's probably the biggest factor that you can go with that plus their experience. You know, how many campaigns have they worked on or, or, or the relevancy of the campaigns that they've worked on to, you know, relevant to your organization. Um, so whether or not they are inside your community or from outside your community, I don't have as big an opinion on that. You know, I have a friend in Northwest Arkansas, uh, my, my former boss who's current friend and mentor and uh, occasional coworker, uh, we're both consultants now, um, but you know he has done a ton of feasibility studies in Northwest Arkansas, and he's very effective at that. And he knows all of those people, so you know it's sure. a very comfortable interview when he goes out and talks to folks. But he's he has shared with me that you know I've talked to these people so many times about so many different organizations that I feel like I'm getting the same information. So, you know, sometimes it does pay to bring somebody from outside of your community. Mm -hmm. to come in and have a fresh conversation and have a fresh objective viewpoint in that in those conversations. And Rich, I know you have worked coast to coast, really, you know, like, so you've worked yeah. outside of your own home-based community. So you've been one of those outsiders that is, that have come in. And as, as you say, like really begin to, um, to learn the vernacular of the language or the language of the organization, of the community, of the constituency base. And you've been so successful. And I love that you brought in the personality match because I think that is a very critical piece. And it's not something that you can identify on paper, right? Like it really yeah. is that connection. 
Yeah. And, and, and honestly, that's what, that's what we look for from the ITM perspective too, is, you know, are, do we feel like this, this client is a good match for us? And would yes. we want to work with this client, you know, on an ongoing basis? Because we, we do, uh, you know, the work that, that, that we do is so personal and it is so sort of, hands on with the organization and the and the the great folks that I work with with my different clients you know I talk to them every single week and up until last March 12th I was traveling on site you know to visit their offices on a regular basis and you know literally being part of their team you know one of the the, one of the highlights of my experience is I'm working with a a children's museum in, in another state and you know, after a year of working with them, um, I got a badge. My, I, I got, I actually, I, I already had a badge um, just to get me in and out of the building, but I got the one year sticker on my badge. And so that was really cool. They considered me part of their team, but that's the kind yeah. of relationship that we really strive for with our clients so that we can be most effective in working with them. It's not I just a, a business relationship. We want that to be a real, we want to have a stake in the game with you right. as well. Right. Let me ask you um, this when we're talking about those relationships and how we're, we're progressing. What are the metrics that you really want to be tracking and looking at so that you know you're navigating through this? I mean, that's one of the things is that, you know, we're talking about the personal side of this and and all of that. But ultimately, you're going to have to, you know, move information up to your board or to the c-suite or yeah. and we're, we're getting so you know data driven what does that look like so i'm glad you asked that question because um you know being a board source governance trainer and being having served on nonprofit boards for the last 22 years or so and i keep track because i started serving when my son was born and he's now 22 uh, <laughs> almost 23 but, you know, I, 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 I always want to come at it from the board perspective and from the executive director perspective, because they're going to want to measure progress, right? And so when we put together a campaign um, and we, we put together the reporting mechanisms, and this all goes back to what you said earlier, Jared, about sort of the pre-campaign preparation and making sure we've got the systems and processes in place and making sure that we've got the right staff in place. Um, but we also want to make sure that we've got the right metrics in place. And so the number one metric that any board of directors is going to look at is dollars raised. How are we towards our goal? Um, but we also want to make sure that we're looking at the number of qualified prospects because every campaign is going to have a chart of gifts. Again, how many gifts do we need at every level in order to be as successful? And not only, you know, how many gifts, but how many prospects do we have who are qualified? And by qualified, I mean... We have a linkage to that, that, that prospect. We've got um, an understanding of their capacity to give. They have um, some affinity towards our organization and we've got a strategy to cultivate and solicit them. That's a qualified prospect for us, right? So we wanna make sure that we've got enough qualified prospects to fill all of those different strata of the, of the gift chart. Um, we're also looking at the number of gifts that come in and the size of gifts that come in. Because again, that 80-20 rule, that we're gonna be focused on top-down fundraising for the, during that quiet phase, Julia, as you mentioned before, you know, we wanna make sure that we're focused on the, the various, very highest capacity gifts to make the biggest impact the fastest. Right. Um, and also the number of asks that are being made and the number of successful asks that right. you know the number of yeses that you get back so those are some of the big uh, metrics that we always want to make sure that we're we're keeping an eye on there's a ton of other metrics that if you really want to get down into the weeds but you know when it comes to the sort of the the one page dashboard report for the board of directors that's what we're going to focus on yeah I love it. that's so great we, it's really it's hard to believe that our time is coming up and i know that jared and i no. are, yeah, no, it, it, it goes by <laughs> Jared and I are really interested in this question. And that is, how do we determine success? I mean, it's easy in a capital campaign. You start with a goal and you're like, okay, we we need to raise $12 million or whatever. But I think Jared and I have been seeing, especially because of COVID-19, there are a lot of other pieces to success. And Mm -hmm. how do we look at those? I mean, should we look at those? Maybe in a capital campaign, we don't. 
Well, and if I may, because I know our time is short, I want to dovetail into this determining success. Is 2021 the year to do a capital campaign? The dumpster fire of 2020, Rich, I know you were working on campaigns last year that will continue, you know, to move forward. Um, and just you know, let's talk about that elephant in the room, you know, like is yeah. it now a time to embark on a campaign or if we're in a campaign, should we deem it complete and put a bow on it and say, yay, <laughs> you know, like what, what does success look like right now? Well, so I think success right now, um, it, it, it looks the same as it always had. And whether or not it's the right time for a campaign depends on your organization. It depends on your readiness for a campaign. Those things don't change. And it depends on what you're trying to impact. Okay. So, so yes, some things have been put on hold because of COVID. And, and a lot of organizations have just been focused on staying open. And, and keeping yeah. staff employed and Survive. God bless them. And, and if we got to pump the brakes and press pause, that's fine. Let's do that. Do what needs to be done to stay alive. But I'm going to, I, I, I would suggest though, that if the, if, if the cause was important enough for a capital campaign in 2019, it's still important enough for a capital campaign in 2021, unless the organization has just been turned on its head through COVID and that may be the case. And so I would say it's sort of a case by case basis. What does success look like? I'm gonna turn that around and, and say, when is it over? And I'd say that a campaign is over when we've made all the solicitations that we've asked, that we, that we plan to make. We've hit our goal. Um, everybody has said, okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really I, important one, right? And, yeah. and, and, and we give our chance we give ourselves a chance to celebrate, right? We set out to do this thing. We did this thing. And now we're able to do that thing out in the community that we set this whole campaign up to do. And now we're able to make this impact because of your gift. And let's celebrate that. And let's celebrate all those people who helped make it happen. That's yeah. when it's over. I love it. And Rich, before we went live and we were in our, our pre chitty chat chat, you know, you made the comment that 2020 brought challenges and it had a lot of silver linings and a lot of things did go really well. And uh, people have had success. Companies have had success. Mm -hmm. Organizations have had success. Um, and yes, we don't want to undermine, uh, you know, the virus. We don't want to undermine everything that it has brought <clears throat> to us as challenges. And right, this and this, it's really been a great time for everyone. I mean, collaboration through the roof, generosity through the roof, altruistic giving through the roof, you know, like we have seen that and all of the statistics show an increase of giving and philanthropy at large, like just in general, is higher this last year than it was the previous, you know, 2019. So, so many good things to celebrate. And I love that we're ending on the celebration note, um, because I think that's really important as we continue to wish everyone a happy new year and move into this new year. So this is Rich's information. Rich Frazier, you are a certified fundraising executive and senior consultant here um, at IPM Advancement. Do check him out on, um, on the website there. If you're any way, shape or form interested in a capital campaign, you know, Rich is phenomenal and Rich, you've got a team behind you. So it's not just you, although you do have a great face and personality, but there's more <laughs> to this. There is more to this team. And so, you know, see if there's a personality and a good fit uh, for your organization. If you're considering a capital in 2021. That's my Thank shameless you, plug for you. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. And IPM Advancement is a, is a national fundraising firm. And yes, we are a team of people and, uh, and a team of consultants. So I love it. Thank you for that. I appreciate the plug. Hey, no, it's been really great. And I, I'm, I'm so um, delighted that we could actually have you on as we kick off this new year, because these are some strategic things that we across our sector need to be talking about. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I've been joined today by my wonderful co-host, the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. 
Um, we really want to make sure that we thank um, all of our sponsors, but we, before we do that, we want to jump in and encourage everybody to participate in the Boardable um, third annual survey. It's really cool. It's only open up, open until the end of this week. So it's a great way for our entire nation to get in and give some opinions about what's working, what's not, challenges, opportunities, and then we can see what everybody else is doing um, across the nonprofit sector. So we really wanna encourage everybody to participate this super quick and easy. Um, and then I'll give you access to that information once it's all revealed. And I do believe Boardable CEO Jeff Banner will come on, um, Jared, and give us the first results. So we'll be the, the forefront of that, which we're very, you know, not that we're competitive or anything. You heard it first here. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. That's hilarious. Again, thanks to all of our sponsors. Without you, we would not be here having this dynamic conversation with people like Rich Frazier. Hey, it's been a great way to navigate through this busy week at the kickoff of the new year. We want to end as we do every show. And that's with our mantra, stay well so you can do well. Thanks everybody. Have a great day and let's see you back here tomorrow.